What does it mean to be a successful person? Money? Fame? Career? Good looks, nice things, a favorable reputation? Or is success something deeper and less worldly? Jesus asks, what will it profit someone if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? I'm Andrew Pettiprin, Fellow of Popular Culture at the Word on Fire Institute. Cinema often uses athletic themes and motifs to depict the nature of success and failure. In a world of winners and losers, great films about physical excellence put into perspective what success physically looks like, thereby evoking a deeper, more spiritual reflection. Three films stand out among my very favorites in this regard, and all for different reasons. First, there is Rocky, the boxing film written by and starring Sylvester Stallone. Next, we examine Black Swan, Darren Aronofsky's beautiful, terrifying modern tale about the vain quest for perfection. Finally, we focus on Chariots of Fire, which depicts two famous British runners, Eric Little and Harold Abrams, very different men with very different goals, who both won gold medals at the 1924 Olympic Games in Paris. Rocky was the surprise hit of 1976. Sylvester Stallone wrote and starred in the film, earning him Academy Award nominations for Best Original Screenplay and Best Actor, a double honor shared with only two other men, film giants Charlie Chaplin and Orson Welles. When we meet Rocky, he is a fledgling boxer and part-time loan shark goon, a fixture on the streets of his tough Philadelphia neighborhood. Everyone knows Rocky. He is a genuinely likable guy, but he is no one's idea of successful. He is the forgotten man, the typical downtrodden cast-off from a world that values everything Rocky lacks, money, career, reputation, and influence. Rocky loves animals, and he takes a shine to the local pet store clerk, a shy woman named Adrian, played by Talia Shire. Adrian's brother Polly belittles Adrian for her looks and personality. Like Rocky, Adrian feels like a loser, a nobody. They're both 30 years old and have been made to feel they're past their prime. Whatever success Rocky and Adrian could have had has just about passed them by. But in the romance that develops between Rocky and Adrian, we begin to see both of them transcend the labels and expectations that have been placed upon them. Maybe, we begin to think, success is something other than what the world says it is. At the same time, Apollo Creed, the heavyweight boxing champion of the world, is looking for a nobody. That is, a nobody from the right city with the right name. In the bicentennial year of 1976, Apollo, played by Carl Weathers, wants to give the fans a show in the city where the American dream was born, Philadelphia. And the Italian stallion is just the man to be seen as a recipient of true American generosity. But what if Rocky is more than a likable punching bag? What if he's not a loser? Adrian says to her brother Pauly, Einstein flunked out of school twice. Beethoven was deaf. Helen Keller was blind. I think Rocky's got a good chance. Rocky's good chance is encapsulated by one of the most famous scenes with one of the most famous pieces of music in movie history, the great training montage that inspired countless imitations. Rocky's up at the crack of dawn. He's running with bricks in his hands and doing one-armed push-ups, He's pouring sweat in the gym and beating up sides of beef in a meat locker. Rocky sprints up the steps of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, looks out on his hometown, and raises his arms victoriously, joy radiating from his face. Whether Rocky wins or loses a particular boxing match on a particular day doesn't really matter anymore. Rocky says to Adrian the night before the fight, I was nobody. But that don't matter either, you know? Because I was thinking, it really don't matter if I lose this fight. It really don't matter if this guy opens up my head either. Because all I want to do is go the distance. 
Nobody's ever gone the distance with Creed. And if I can go that distance, you see, and that bell rings and I'm still standing, I'm going to know for the first time in my life, see, that I weren't just another bum from the neighborhood. And go the distance, Rocky does. Although he loses the fight on a decision, Rocky makes it to the end of the 15-round bout without getting knocked out by the greatest fighter on earth. With his face smashed and bleeding, Rocky doesn't care to hear the decision being announced or to field questions about a rematch. Adrian makes her way to the ring telling Rocky, I love you. He replies, I love you. Now there's success. Darren Aronofsky's Black Swan is about purity and perfection, about the clean lines and elegant movement of classical ballet. In some ways, a bit like boxing. It's about technique and discipline, requiring superhuman agility and endurance. But in Black Swan, ballet is the vehicle for a journey through the cold pursuit of achievement and the obsession with success embodied by Nina, played by Natalie Portman in a once in a generation performance for which she won the Best Actress Award at the 2011 Academy Awards. Nina dances in the company at the New York City Ballet, and she aspires to be a prima ballerina in one of the most famous roles in all of classical dance, the dual part of the white and black swans in Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake. Nina lives in a New York City apartment with her overbearing stage mom, Erica, played by Barbara Hershey. Nina's life is highly regimented, forsaking most normal comforts, friendships, and romantic attachments for the sake of perfecting her craft. She dances until her feet bleed. She lies about pain and fatigue, and she either pushes away or throws up the small number of calories she is allowed to eat each day. She lives the part of the white swan every day, a pure, spotless creature. When she auditions for the leading role, however, she fails to capture the black swan. She ends up getting the part anyway, a professional success which, instead of bringing her joy and satisfaction, leads her into madness. Nina continues to struggle with her mother's overbearing nature paired with the lecherous manipulations of Thomas, the show's director. Nina works maniacally on her technique, but she is constantly told that she needs to loosen control, to let go. I just want to be perfect, she repeats quietly to herself. But observing Nina's friend and rival Lily, played by Mila Kunis, Thomas says to Nina, watch the way she moves, imprecise but effortless, She's not faking it. Nina begins to abuse herself in various new ways, finally unleashing the black swan within her just before she is due to return to the stage for the finale of the show. She smashes a mirror in a manic hallucination in which she thinks she is attacking Lily. As the final notes sound and Nina falls to the ground, she is bleeding profusely from her abdomen from a large shard of glass from the broken mirror. With the crowd roaring in the background, the bright stage lights above her and the entire cast, including Thomas, looking down on her in admiration and horror, she whispers, I was perfect. As the screen fades to black, we know this can't be what success looks like. In Hugh Hudson's 1981 classic, Chariots of Fire, we consider the idea of success that we have explored so far in Rocky and Black Swan in a more overtly theological way. Chariots of Fire is about the historic 1924 British Olympic track and field team, focusing most of all on two equally gifted but very different men. Harold Abrams, played by Ben Cross, and Eric Little, played by Ian Charlson. Harold is a brilliant, brash lawyer in the making. When we meet him, he is beginning his undergraduate education at Cambridge University, where the mood is somber. The young men in Harold's class are made keenly aware that their immediate predecessors, the brightest and best, the most potentially successful men of the British Empire, have mostly just about been wiped out in World War I. 
All the new students are haunted by the specter of the lost opportunities of the glorious dead. But Harold lives with an added anxiety. In a world of at least nominal Christians from old English families, he is the son of immigrant parents and a Jew. How will he succeed? The answer? He is a blazingly fast runner who accepts all challenges and pushes himself to the limit to be the best at everything. After breaking a centuries-old record for dashing around his college quadrangle, starring in the university's Gilbert and Sullivan Opera Society, writing up anonymous articles praising his running efforts, Harold falls in love. Meeting Sybil Gordon, a famous opera star, is itself a bit of a challenge to be overcome at first. But Harold quickly finds in Sybil someone with whom he can truly be himself. Sybil asks Harold, do you love running? He replies, I'm more of an addict. It's a compulsion, a weapon. Harold engages the services of professional running coach Sam Musabini, played by Ian Holm, and Harold is roundly criticized, even shamed, by his college president for failing to pursue a more gentlemanly path as an amateur. Harold is shocked to have his honor questioned, but is more emboldened than ever to succeed on the track and throw the shame back on his critics. Not surprisingly, his soul is all churned up. As he prepares to run in the 100-meter finals at the Olympics years later, Harold tells his teammate, Aubrey Montague, I'm forever in pursuit, and I don't even know what I am chasing. Harold then describes the stakes as he perceives them for his success or failure. I will raise my eyes and look down that corridor, four feet wide, with ten lonely seconds to justify my whole existence. Harold finally confesses, I'm almost afraid to win. What happens to a soul fixated only on achieving a particular worldly goal once the goal is achieved? Despite his fear, Harold does win, and he soon finds out. He is forlorn, and he decides to let loose and get drunk with Sam, his trainer, who tells him to go home to England, get married, and put running and all of his anxieties about worldly achievement to bed. At this moment, the tide turns for Harold. Harold has lived like Nina, the perfect ballerina in Black Swan, but he changes course, choosing success that looks more like Rockies instead. Harold marries Sybil, and he becomes the elder statesman of the sport he loves. His true success is summed up by the solemn but touching scenes of his funeral at the beginning and end of the film. Arguably, the even more inspiring and more theologically significant winner in Chariots of Fire is Eric Little, who is a committed Christian and a wildly fast sprinter. Like Harold, Eric is also a bit of an outsider. A Scot, the son of missionaries, and a strict teetotaler who will not work or play on Sunday. Eric uses his notoriety as an athlete to share the gospel and to point to the source of his strength. From the beginning, we know Eric's success is always about Christ and his kingdom. When Eric runs, he throws his head back and lets his arms fly. He looks like he is having the time of his life, and knowing that he has a rich prayer life, love of scripture, and a passion for preaching and teaching, his athletic prowess demonstrates what Pope Francis calls the Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. After one track meet, Eric gathers the crowd around him in the rain and tells them, Where does the power come from to see the race to its end? From within. Jesus said, Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. If with all your hearts you truly seek me, you shall ever surely find me. If you commit yourself to the love of Christ, then that is how you run a straight race. Here we see a truly successful man in the eyes of the world, but he prescribes a heavenly recipe for success instead. Eric runs into trouble with his beloved sister Jenny, 
who wants him to focus on the missionary work they are doing together in Edinburgh instead of training so intensely for the Olympic Games. Eric takes Jenny on a walk and tells her that once the Games are finished, he is planning to go to China as a missionary. He says, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Eric makes the Olympic team and is on a collision course with a gold medal, the same medal that Harold Abrams wants. But he learns that in order to achieve it, he will have to break his sacred principle and run on a Sunday. Eric refuses, provoking an English aristocrat who is a member of the British Olympic Committee to bark at him, in my day it was king first, God after. Eric will not budge, causing another team member, Lord Andrew Lindsay, to give Eric his spot in a different race. When Eric finally lines up for his race, an American runner, just as enamored as Lord Lindsay is with Eric's joy of the gospel and his commitment to true success, puts a note in Eric's hand reading, It says in the old book, He who honors me, I will honor. Seconds later, Eric has won his gold medal. In the New Testament, St. Paul equates the fullness of life with God, real success, with running and fighting. He tells his protege, Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He tells the Corinthians, I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air. Paul traveled all around the Mediterranean world. He was imprisoned, shipwrecked, bitten by a snake, and he found himself at the end of his life under house arrest in Rome. None of this looked like success to the world, but was more than victory in the service of God. Paul ran and fought and maybe even danced a bit too. At any rate, we know he got up in front of people and commanded attention. The mark of Paul's success in life is that despite all his trials and tribulations, despite getting knocked down in the ring and running out of breath on the road and collapsing on stage, he never despaired, he never forgot what his goal was, and he never forgot where his strength came from. He went the distance. May our success look in the end like Paul's and the Lord whom Paul served.